I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Well, hot damn, we made it to the mics finally, guys. Yes, we did. <laughs> really? What a journey over the past day. I feel like it's been, uh, I feel like we've been here a week. Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, it's been really actually quite, um, quite wild to um, have Dr. John Laurence here uh, in Matt's clinic and uh, Matt doing all kinds of work with kind of um, John being our wingman and observing and Watching helping out. Matt do his magic. Yeah, yeah, it's been pretty, it's been pretty it's freaking pretty amazing. Pretty cool. So, I guess we'll start out perhaps, um, Matt, you could give your definition of regenerative medicine, or actually both of you can just kind of give what you do, because you both have these incredible clinics that are very cutting edge, and I'd like to just kind of um, familiarize people with your perspective on that. That was a good one. Um, So regenerative medicine, I think, is an approach towards healing the body from uh, at every level with uh, techniques that involve both IVs, uh, uh, procedures like plasma phoresis that sort of reset the immune system, and then uh, primarily focused around different injections that we use to uh, to reboot and reset the 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 um, musculoskeletal system. And so we do nerve hydrodissection, we do ultrasound guided injections into joints, into fascia. Uh, we actually inject into the bone marrow sometimes. And so there's a, a wide variety of different injections and different materials that we use that have a healing effect on uh, tissues of the body. And then what we do is try to try to use those approaches and those techniques to, to basically heal the body and, and uh, reset it. Cool. Mm-hmm. What, how would you define that and what you do at your, your clinic in Sarasota? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Matt and to his point, you know, that, you know, there's a variety of different ways to um, to apply regenerative medicine, but ultimately you're fixing the cause. And there's, you know, a lot of different expressions of disease that are just a symptom. And it's just that it's an expression, you know, like you got a runny nose, you got, um, you know, an upset stomach, um, you have pain in your body somewhere. Like if we just look at pain and we were to say, okay, is the problem pain, which is probably inflammation is underlying, but is the inflammation even the problem, right? So I'm going to take an anti-inflammatory or pain reliever, but is that really fixing anything? So it's, in my opinion, you know, you're painting over rust in that situation. So, you know, if you were to look at, put it. if you were to look at arthritis, you know, what I tell my patients in the clinic is, you know, let's get rid of that word because it, people get confused. You know, they think it's like, it's like a cold, something they catch or genetic and, they, they get very baffled and, you know, when we come in and we also do a lot of ultrasound, which I think clinically is one of the biggest game changers ever because you can see and diagnose and then you can actually guide your procedures to the soft tissues and some of the hydrodissection that I watched um, Dr. Cook do yesterday and he has an absolute black belt with it, uh, which I think we should dive a little bit into. But, but being able to go in there and see what arthritis looks like, which is rough cartilage and loose ligaments. So if you have an injury or there's postural or, or, or bad habits that you have that are stressing the connective tissue, that connective tissue breaks down. It allows the joint to start moving into a position that starts stressing the cartilage where it's normally supposed to be setting in a certain you know juxtaposition. And so you start to get chips and roughness of that cartilage and the, and the connective tissues loose. So let's call arthritis loose ligaments and rough cartilage because that's actually what's happening. So anybody that has you know, any type of arthritic pain, they need to be using their, their, their thought processes. What can I do to strengthen ligaments and you know, get, to get cartilage to be smooth and friction-free? I mean, cartilage is really an amazing structure. It's... it's um, 10 times slipperier than ice on ice. You know, I mean, man has made something so incredible and I'm sorry, our body has made it right. But we, we have these joint replacements. It's not any, anything close to what, you know, what our body actually does. And so it's this friction-free surface that allows inflammation not to occur. 
And when you start getting roughness, it's like sandpaper, you know, and you get friction and that stirs up the inflammation and then you see all the fluid on the joint and the pain. So fixing those problems is, in my opinion, that's, a, that's regenerative medicine. Awesome. So same kind of root cause thing rather than just looking at symptoms, uh, which are ultimately going to, I think, in biomechanical situations going to end to uh, end up in surgery or prescription drugs that you might even become dependent on to stay symptom free, which doesn't sound like much fun to me. Uh, so let's see where I want to go with this. You know, we had, uh, I, I yeah. remember so clearly when I was a, a second year anesthesia resident in, in the year 2000. And from a, I don't, from a, I don't know where it came from, but from a governmental level, they said, we need to pay more attention to pain. And I think doctors had always been somewhat like accepting of pain. And so they said, pain is the fifth vital sign. And so at that time, it was kind of interesting. Uh, nobody was really taking narcotics that much. And at that time in San Francisco, there was a heroin epidemic. But the most heroin anybody would take was like one or two or three grams. And I'd never even heard of heroin until I got to residency. And so then we would take care of a lot of heroin addicts in the emergency room. But then all of a sudden, pain is the fifth vital sign. Everybody started paying attention to it. And then they thought, well, we're going to get rid of this. And how are we going to get rid of it? With opioids. And so then, and, and so then what happened is, and I remember this anesthesiologist, and she said, well, don't worry, because you'll just go in and you'll give these people fentanyl. And then nobody... She goes, everybody falls asleep with 10 cc's of fentanyl, which was 500 micrograms. And so then that was like this thing that we always did for the heroin users because it got them enough narcotic to keep them comfortable and we would get them through that. And then over the next five or six years, what happened is all of a sudden there was this explosion of opioids that came onto the market. And then next thing you know, everybody's taking opioids and we had an opioid epidemic. And it's super hard for people to get off of those. And so then that created this wave just from one kind of governmental idea that seemed like a good idea at the time. And I remember going to that lecture and I was super pumped up because I was like, oh, we're going to start paying attention to pain. This is my, my career is going to be amazing. We're going to mm. give people pain medicine. Yeah. And then now it's like we go so far out of our way to never write a pain an opioid prescription, and I almost never do, but still everybody's afraid because it created such a catastrophe for the last 20 years. Yeah, certainly. It seems to be getting worse in many ways. So uh, either one of you could answer this maybe in, a, in your own way. What are some of the most common symptoms of pain? It seems to me that often it has to do with joints. Like it's centered around a joint, whether someone has lower back pain, uh, knee problems, ankle problems, big toe problems, elbow, tendonitis, all this kind of stuff. Uh, what are some of the root causes then of the pain that we experience? Well, you know, there's, there's a number of different um, tissues that can produce pain. You know, nerves can produce pain, ligaments can produce pain, tendons, muscles, fascia. Um, one of the things that, uh, that Matt does in his clinic where, where it's just fascinating. I, I, I want to learn more about this. We, we do a little bit of this in our clinic, but this nerve hydrodissection, which you're actually addressing the fascia and you're addressing the nerve. So imagine in your body, you have um, muscles that need to move past each other, right? And over joints and over bones and, and tendons and so forth. So there's this, this motion that happens within the body between all these different planes and that needs to be friction free. You know, I also do cranial work and there's connective tissue in and around the cranium that gets adhesions to it and can cause disruption to um, the flow of, of, of circulation, right? So I'm, al I'm always telling my patients, you're either a swamp or a river, right? And so when tissues become more swampy, they become more toxic, this favors more pain. So um, some of the procedures that, um, that Matt does in his practice is under ultrasound, he can go in there and literally inject within these planes, which I watched him do with your back, right? And so he was, and you saw some of yeah, these procedures, it right? <laughs> and, and it just opens it up. And so then that opens up and it frees those adhesions. And now you have all this movement that's normal. 
And so you can literally um, see people that can't even touch their toes. And after getting worked on with this hydro dissection, it's just the flexibility is just incredible. I'm sure you could kind of speak to that as well. Yeah. Um, so then if you go back to kind of like what I like what you said, if these different causes of pain will cause different genres and types of pain. And so then, um, and there's different, a whole bunch of different types of nerves and they will carry different genres of pain too. So it's like pain is not just like one word, it's a whole bunch of sort of different categories. And so sometimes there's uh, a, a pain that is like from like a, a tendon is torn. And so then there's nerve that goes to that tendon and the nerve is telling you that that tendon is partially torn. Sometimes a nerve goes underneath a tunnel, like carpal tunnel. And if that nerve is pinched, then that can create pain. Sometimes a um, person in maybe one part of the body or in one area, they don't get enough blood flow. And so then there's a chronic lack of blood flow and that lack of oxygen and lack, lack of flow to the tissue can cause pain. And so that's a different type of pain. And then what I generally see is, is that most people have a little bit of two or three different categories of pain. So sometimes there's some nerve impingement. Sometimes there's some inflammatory thing going on that may be inflammation in the joint. And, and the cause of that inflammation in the joint may be just what John said, that lo those loose ligaments causing hypermobility. And certain people, like you hear about people that, that are hi called hypermobility or Erlos-Danlos syndrome, it's called EDS in some communities. A lot of those people will have much more pain. And then interestingly, those people I find to be more susceptible to kind of chronic infections and then the pain, this infection type of pain. So for example, people with Lyme disease mm -hmm. can have pain in joints. So you have all of these different categories. And so our job as clinicians is to try to suss out of these different types of pain, which one do we think it is? And then depending on that, then that says, oh, okay, then I've got a handful of different modalities here and then trying to pick and choose the right modality based on the type of pain that that person has. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, go ahead, John. Well, uh, you know, we were going to get into DISC, right? And I, I'm going to just kind of jump in right now. Okay. Right? So <laughs> DISC pain is fairly rare in older age, right? And there's such a huge myopic view of back pain, meaning that it's it's all DISC, right? In fact, in my practice, I'm sure your practice is the same thing. Everybody shows up, I've got my MRI, I've got a disc problem, what can you do for my disc? And there's no, no concept that maybe it's not even your disc causing the pain. So there's something called referred pain. And referred pain can often come from connective tissue. So if you look at the textbooks and you look at leg pain, for instance, um, there's five different of co the common causes of leg pain. There's, there's a disc, which would be a nerve root, right? Then there's SI joint, there's the SI ligaments, then there's the hip and there's the hip capsule. So out of all those five causes of leg pain, only one is the disc. So why, why is there such a huge focus on disc when it's like sciatic, right? So in our practice, um, we do a procedure called prolotherapy uh, very commonly, especially for patients with um, different, co more complex pain. And so um, prolotherapy is a regenerative treatment. Uh, we've been doing it in our pr practice for about 25 years, and it's using dextrose, which is a sugar, and it's hypertonic, and it stimulates an inflammatory response that leads to collagen synthesis and basically regeneration. So what's nice about it is that there's lidocaine with it as well. So if we take it step by step, like somebody comes, comes to our office and they have leg pain, we can go in and inject their SI joint if they, if they palpate. So I know Dr. Cook was doing a lot of palpation. I thought it was genius the way he was going in with his thumb and very meticulously like feeling, okay, is this right where you feel your pain? And then he'd take his ultrasound, he'd look, and he's, he's poking on the side. You can kind of see the tissues moving and he's looking to see if, are those fascial planes working or not? You know, and it's just such a, such a, a great way to look in and find out where is that pain producing tissue coming from? Where's the origin of that pain? 
and then directing. Once you figure that out and you can look at it with an ultrasound, which is, in my opinion, better than an MRI or x-ray, you can look at it and see what's going on there. What's that tissue? What type of tissue it is? And then, you know, Dr. Cook and I, we both have this, this, this kind of palette of things that we use, you know, and most of them are injected, but there's also like electrical devices, like you had used one today in the practice. We use a, a sound wave device, ultrasound, laser. I mean, so you can kind of use, in, in, my, in our practices, we kind of fuse a few different things together to kind of um, target these specific areas. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the prolotherapy and that you put lidocaine. I, I was doing that for back pain years ago, and I don't think they put the lidocaine. It was so painful. It uh, was it was brutal, and it was right on my back. But but to your point, maybe there's something in the kind of the easy road of blaming pain like back pain on a disc rather than referred pain and this nerve pain that could be located in any number of places. I remember years ago, I went to a very traditional, I don't know if he was an osteopath or what, in Beverly Hills, and I said, I have lower back pain. Mm-hmm. Got me an MRI, and one of my discs was a little dehydrated, you know, a little little smaller than the others. And his recommendation without even thinking about it was, oh, we'll just fuse that, you know, come on back in. And I thought, eh, that sounds a little <laughs> weird. Like, I don't feel like I want to stop the mobility in one of yeah, my no. uh, vertebrae, right? It was, no. thankfully, I, I didn't do it, but, you know, come to find out, I come in yesterday and get treated by Matt. And it's like, we're not even, we're not even looking anywhere around the discs. It's mm-hmm. this whole other thing, you yeah. know? So perhaps, do you think that that's often kind of, the place certain doctors go just because it's like an easy fix with surgery and uh, well they're they're, indoctrinated into that right you know they've got the mri and the insurance companies pay for it right the surgeons who do a lot of back surgeries it's it's just low-lying fruit for them you know it's just you know it's sad you know i i feel sad i feel that um there should be some more education and i wish that because I've got a lot of patients that come in after they've had surgery, you know, multiple surgeries, and we do this prolotherapy and it's their SI joint or their iliolumbar ligament or their hip joint. I'm sure you've seen it a million times as well. Yeah, the, um, in my sort of analogy, and I kind of have some good thoughts on prolotherapy. And, and interestingly, for years, I've been going to Mexico and then we'll go down and we'll do like kind of mission type of trips and do prolotherapy for people. So even though I don't do dextrose prolotherapy in my practice now, I've done a lot of it over the years and I've had, and it's kind of like a hallelujah when you go and somebody's had pain for a long time and then you fix it. And it's just kind of like, amazing. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome to, to go do stuff like that. Um, when I think of the spine, the, if you see the, the spine, it looks like a a tower. And so in the front, you've got a vertebra and a disc and a vertebra and a disc. It's kind of like a pile of pancakes going up on the front. And in the back, at every level, there's two facet joints. And so then that, and they they have a, a, a kind of like, almost like two hands touching each other. And so then they can rotate a little bit, which is why we can turn. And then the spinal cords in the middle and then all the nerves come out the side. And so I like to say that half the force is going through the front of the spine, through the vertebra and the discs, and then half the force is going through the back of the spine, through the facet joints, and then all they call it the posterior ligamentous complex, all the ligaments and tendons and fascia. Mm-hmm. And so that and the nerves are going out the side. Now, as long as everything is going great with what I just said, then you're basically going to be totally fine. However, what happens a lot of times is people will get a little arthritis in those facet joints and then those facet joints aren't quite as good at handling their half of the force and so then that causes dysfunction the other thing that happens when that happens is it puts the nerves that are going by the facet joints into a little bit of spasm when that happens that puts the erector spinae and a lot of your muscles into spasm which further compromises efficient flow of force going through your back and so as a result of that and that dysfunction i think that that sets you up for a susceptibility for a little bit of a disc herniation Mm -hmm. but when somebody presents just like they present to you and just like they present to me with back pain with a little bit of a disc 99% 99% of the time when I put the ultrasound down, I find two or three other things. 
And then generally what I do is I treat those things and generally we're able to start to stabilize, get improved function, force flowing through the spine. And then by treating facet joints and the posterior ligamentous complex, and there's a hundred ways that are all kind of useful and good that we could kind of discuss. And then generally those usually get better. Now we will go into a disc, um, but there's more complications with going into a disc and it's a, a bigger thing. And so then I do like to start with the other stuff and I think it's, it's a better way to go. And even if you talk to sophisticated regenerative people that I know, generally we talk to a lot of people and say, you know what, I used to do discs, but lately I'm not doing so many because yeah. I just pick so many people without it. Yeah, that's true. Can you break down what we did in my procedure yesterday, which was to me, as John's indicated, I mean, just watching your whole uh, operation at BioReset, uh, which is for those listening is here in uh, Los Gatos, California, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, I mean, the whole operation was just so seamless. There's this orchestration of people that was really fascinating to watch. Just, you know, your techs and assistants are just showing up with plates of syringes and everyone's just on time. They know where to be. It's, it's actually really quite a workflow there that was very impressive. But beyond that, uh, having the ability with the ultrasound for me to lay on the table and, you know, watch these needles going in with the hydro section. I mean, it was just really, just a fascinating experience. Actually, I felt like I was on, you know, I had fast forwarded in medicine by 25 years. I mean, it felt so futuristic versus kind of the old model you spoke to of you go get an MRI and they want to fuse your discs and, you know, just like, sur you know, like real surgery. This was more of a procedure involving a bunch of needles. So maybe you could kind of break down how you got to what you felt the root of the problem was, which we kind of arrived at today and some of the things that you did. And then John, it might be interesting for you. Um, let's say we weren't even out at, at Matt's clinic at all. And I came to see you uh, at advanced Rejuven rejuvenation in Sarasota. What would have you done differently? Would you have em employed any other tools that, that we didn't, or how, how would you have seen it? So maybe start with Matt and just kind of break down what we did. It was really incredible. Okay, so that was a good one. So we talked for a little bit, and, and basically what I heard is, is that you had a traumatic experience probably 25 years ago, but then after, and after that, you, you got better, but then you've had 15 years of fairly substantial pain in the front of the hip, and then also almost that long of a pain that was in the low back SI joint area that's been moderately in, intense in the ballpark of a four or five out of 10. That, and sometimes worse and sometimes better. And sometimes it, 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 it bothers you standing and sometimes, and the standing is um, uh, more with, in the front with the hip and then sitting in, in a hard chair is in the low back. Yes, so, hence the pillows underneath me. <laughs> hence the pillows. So, so then we we talked a fair bit and kind of, and I generally try to do that to try to get a sense of the trajectory, what's what's happened, and you had had stem cells and it hadn't helped, which which was a good one. Um, and so then immediately that started to make me think, oh, okay, that was probably a good stem cell treatment. And so then it may not be his joint because they treated your joints. Mm -hmm. So then that was kind of cluing me in. Oh, okay, I wonder if that's the if if this is something else. And so then we did. Uh, uh, I I did what I almost always do, which is kind of check in. Otherwise, totally healthy. And so I gave you some IVs. I gave you vitamin C and uh, uh, glutathione and uh, a little bit of NAD and some other things like that. Then um, oh, we skipped the NAD. So then, uh, I had, because I had one NAD, of John's suppository, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I have on right now. <laughs> so then, um, and so then, uh, then we did the ultrasound exam and sort of looked around. And it was interesting. You have you had a lot of pain at your S1 foramen, which is the foramen that um, uh, the first foramen uh, of your sacrum where some nerves come out. 
and you had some pain in your lumbar facet joints and you had some pain in where your SI joint is. And then we rolled, we rolled you over and then you didn't have much, hardly any pain in your transverse processes. Um, and I, I looked at a bunch of other things that you didn't have. And, and so then we rolled you over. You had some pain in your greater trochanter and then you had a lot of pain in the front of your hip, not really in the ball and socket of your hip joint, but it, when I palpated the psoas tendon and the psoas tendon is your primary hip flexor. And then you also had a moderate amount of pain in the, the top of a muscle called the sartorius, mm. um, which is another hip flexor. So basically you had two hip flexors that had quite a bit of pain. Your joint actually looked, your hip joint looked pretty good and some pain in your, your, your greater trochanter. So then I, we put that all together and sort of made a plan. And so then what I did is, um, I, uh, I, we did, uh, placental matrix and we used placental matrix to treat your, um, your facet joints, and I treated all the facet joints, uh, uh, the bottom facet joints on your right, L3-4, L4-5, and L5-1, S1. Um, I did and uh, a transfer, uh, I did. I went actually through that foramen, and then I did an epidural uh, at uh, S1. I actually went into the SI joint and treated your SI joint with placental matrix also. And then I uh, did a hydrodissection with placental matrix of your thoracolumbar fascia. And basically what happens is, is I told you that uh, you've got two facet joints at every level. And then uh, as superficial to those joints, you've got all of these muscles. And then superficial to all of the muscles, so basically like just a centimeter under your skin, there's a fascia that's all, looks, it's almost like a sail and all of the muscles attached to it. And a lot of times that can be a pain generator because the, the nerves that go to your skin have to pierce that and go through that to get to, so that they can get all the way out to your skin and provide sensation. And a lot of times people that have been in pain for a long, long time will have pain there. So then what I did is I did this hydrodissection of the thoracolumbar fascia, which it, for anybody that wants to know, on a scale from one to 10 of being difficult is about a two, super easy to do once you know how. And so then I, I'm kind of into the idea of like Grateful Dead style, <laughs> yeah. disseminating as much information as possible. Uh, yeah. And we listened to the Grateful Dead we while did. we did the yeah. treatment. I got to say like the whole, the whole experience, A, from just how long you chatted with me and how much detail you went into. I mean, I'm thinking of just a traditional allopathic visit it's like okay where's it hurt whatever here's a pill or let's sign you up for surgery or whatever it's like you really went into great detail but maybe my favorite part was listening to the dead while this whole procedure was going on and you're singing i'm singing i mean i'm like this is very untraditional to say the least but um so but, the, you know anyway that that added but to it's it. kind of interesting but then and then i were it's interesting so when and then we're talking and so it's like a very serious experience and yet the music is has a lot of insight and wisdom and so i kind of I, I always quote lyrics as they're coming up because interestingly sometimes emotional things come up and so then we we went uh to the side and i treated the greater trochanter a little bit uh and i did a hydrodissection of the proximal sartorius where I basically I come underneath that muscle and I put fluid in the fascial plane where that is. And a lot of times that releases a, a bunch of the, the proximal hip flexor muscles and, and they'll function better. And then I did this cool hydrodissection where I do a hydrodissection between that and the tensor fascia lata. And that's the muscle that attaches to your IT band and you've had kind of this tight IT band thing forever. Yeah. And I had that too. And I did this and sort of fixed it. And so it's been an interesting experience. And I'm going to have you do some peptides and some other things that are going to continue the treatment ongoing. Mm -hmm. But then the, the other thing that I did is I, I actually went um, uh, and I come above the hip. And then I do a hydrodissection of the psoas tendon. And interestingly, that was the thing that you were like, oh, this is the pain that I have all the time. So then we treated that. And then I treated your hip joint as well. Mm -hmm. And so then that's 
most of of what we did and so then we we um uh we did that it was interesting because then you were like oh the the psoas tendon is the thing that hurts me and then i had been watching you walk and then i was talking to john about it and so we were like is this my favorite thing when anyone like other than me comes comes to my clinic because then i'm tr- i'm not like trying to i'm trying to absorb everything that you have and especially since you come from the chiropractic background mm-hmm. like chiropractors are always better than me at like movement assessment and and like seeing things and you're always like two steps ahead of me but then i'm trying to like <laughs> oh okay, okay that's what that is and so then it was kind of cool because as i watched i began to realize and it really sunk into me today you walk with a little bit of a trend allenberg gait where you're avoiding putting force through your psoas tendon because i think that's been so irritated for so long and then I think that what happened is, is because of that, that caused you to put a little extra torque and exaggerated lift basically on your lower facet joints and your, your SI ligaments. And so that creates that torque in the back. And so then basically, and, and, and interestingly, when we, I was pushing on your psoas and we were doing things, you were like, oh, this is causing pain in, in my SI joint. And so then... And so part of that is that those are reciprocals of each other that are doing the same thing. And so there's this, what you said, reciprocal inhibition is super awesome thing to talk about maybe later. But then the other part of that is, is that with reciprocal pairs, if there's a problem with one, then you always end up with the problem in the other one. And, And part of that is at baseline, but part of that is with dynamic movement. Got it, got it. And could you explain to people what placental matrix is? Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, placental matrix is a product where they take, if a a woman can donate her placenta when she has an elective C-section. So it's great because from um, it's just donated tissue. And so then I used to participate in this when I was an anesthesiologist because I used to do um, C-sections all the time. Uh, and I used to play music during C-sections. That was kind of how I got into it because I found like things would go like infinitely better if I would just play music for people that they liked and kind of cheer them up that way and kind of puts them. And there's a bunch of evidence actually in our literature and the anesthesia literature that people will have less pain and do better when music is playing it's, if it's kind of managed appropriately and stuff like that. Mm. But then what happens is, is the placenta has uh, some growth factors. It's got connective tissue. It has a lot of anti-infection properties. And then what they do is they sterilize it. So uh, there's no living cells, and which is nice. It's just connective tissue. There's a lot of collagen in there. And then there's some growth factors. And that acts as a scaffold, and it tends to stay there. So I always say, if I spilled water on my jeans... And I told you this yesterday, by the time dinner comes, you're never even going to notice that I did that. But if I spilled a green smoothie on there, the green smoothies could be on my pants until they go to the dry cleaner, at least for a couple months. And sure enough, when you put a placental tissue around a tendon, like I did around your your psoas tendon, that's going to be around there and it's going to be causing your own cells to migrate in there and start to heal that. And it's going to stay there probably for a couple months. Interesting. And so I'll have huh. people, I'll have about, I'll tell people this is going to work for three months. The reality is it's going to take longer. The studies where they look at PRP, they evaluate the effectiveness of the treatment at nine months. We think the placental matrix works a lot quicker, but if you have that time frame, you can, you can imagine that, you know, every once in a while, somebody will call me and they'll be like, oh, I'm still not better. And I always say, remember, we got a, our real final end date. It's going to be in, in 90 days. And I'll have every maybe 5% of the time, I'll have somebody call at like 85 days. And they're like, oh, I'm so much better. It just it's, it's kind of like it finally kicked in. So mm-hmm. it's important to remember that that time course. And so yeah. with the placental matrix sticking like a smoothie rather than water, um, if one were to use um, stem cells or exosomes and these kind of things, they wouldn't hang around as long, right? They they probably don't hang around as long. Mm-hmm. But then each 
each product in regenerative medicine has a profile. So stem cells work in a certain way, exosomes work in a certain way, placental matrix works in a certain way. There's a lot of uh, now more than ever, you know, regulatory issues, and it's uncertain what what we're going to be left with and what's going to be taken away. And so my philosophy is I'm just sort of waiting for guidance, and mm-hmm. I'm going to follow, you know, whatever they say. But um, the the there's our feeling is is that there are several regulatory categories, and the the easiest regulatory category to meet is is something that's called less than minimally manipulated. Mm-hmm. And so that's a product that uh, the regulatory number for that is three six one. And so uh, the companies that we use, uh, which is called Sky Biologics. And uh, strongly believes that their product is a three six three six one product, and that it's less than minimal, minimally manipulated, which means not a whole lot of engineering and and laboratory process was done on that. That it's a safe product; it doesn't have somebody else's cells in it, and so that we can use that, and that it would be helpful. So, with the FDA in terms of regulation, it's sort of like whether or not something's categorized as a drug based on how much it's been manipulated. So hence the stem cell tourism, you go to Panama or another country and they can culture stem cells and give you way more of them, et cetera. But that's, if you did that here, that would be illegal because that's technically a drug because there's so much kind of uh, manipulation in the lab that happens. Right, right. So that we take people out of the country for, uh, for those type of processes, but, um, but that's exactly right. And so it's unclear what's going to happen with exosomes, but I think that um, 99.9% exosomes are going to be considered to be a drug. And so then we'll see how that evolves over time. Got it. Mm-hmm. And so we're sort of preparing to to really have a, a big emphasis of using placental matrix and PRP and some of the other regenerative products that are uh, uh, not too controversial. Right. And so PRP being platelet rich plasma mm-hmm. which I, I did a number of years ago on like a tennis elbow thing and it just problem solved mm-hmm. just fixed never came back it was incredible and it was ultrasound guided also i forget the woman's name that did it in la it was quite quite a while ago i think it was fairly new at that time maybe 15 years ago or something oh that's good um i want to ask you john let's say we didn't even know matt and i flew out to advanced rejuvenation to see you and you assessed me what, if anything, would have been different about your protocol? Would you have employed any different tools or uh, do you do much of the same work? What, what would that look like for you? Well, listen, um, the skill set that it took Matt to do your treatment was enormous. I mean, this is not something that a lot of doctors have available to them. I mean, he's he, he's creative. He, he's put a lot of time in clinically. He's got some amazing tools that he's using. And, and it was, you know, it was humbling to watch the treatment. I mean, he did a beautiful job and, uh, I think that's going to be really, really, uh, helpful for you. You know, I see that being, uh, an answer to, you know, problem you've had for a long time. Um, so yeah, there might be some, some, some differences, but you know, the overall gist is that, you know, uh, Matt figured out where the pain was coming from. You know, and, you know, I might have used our TRT machines or we have a, the stem wave. Uh, this sends these um, sound waves into the body. And when it interacts with damaged tissues, uh, it, it, you can feel it, you know. So whether it was me or, uh, you know, Dr. Dan Kirshner at, in my clinic, giving him a shout out. Hey, Dan. <laughs> What's up, Dan? Um, he 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 gives me a report back and says, "Hey, you know, it looks like the sartorius or the iliolumbar or the SI or the psoas or wherever seems to be, you know, active." And um, and so I take that into account. We also do palpation. Obviously, you know, my naturopathic and chiropractic background um, has a lot of training with with you know hands on and and there would be you know some structural. Uh, things that we would probably look at and I do kinesiology as well and you know we had kind of talked about your glute being you know not activated and then that reciprocal inhibition bringing that so as to be so tight Um, I probably would have used bone marrow in your case and for me it's just when I see a lot of different um, areas that need to be treated 
Um, we're able to pull bone marrow. Um, we use, you know, anesthesia for these um, procedures. It's fairly, um, you know, comfortable for most patients. You know, a lot of people, when we start talking about like, oh, you know, some people are a little bit nervous about it, but it, it's With often... the ice pit getting hammered into your hip bone, no big deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, most people, our goal is most people, once they're, they're done getting their bone marrow aspirated, they're like, you know, oh, that wasn't bad at all. Yeah. You know, so... Um, and it gives us a lot of material to work with. You know, so I know. you're getting you're getting marrow derived stem cells, uh, endogenous stem cells from a person's body, and then reinserting them uh, to areas where there's damaged tissue, etc. You, you know, looking at the regulation. So we used to use um, fat. So we used to do a um, a liposuction, and then we would dissolve the fat and take the stem cells from the fat because fat's a huge reservoir of stem cells. But the FDA came along and said, you know, you can't do that anymore. It's more than manipulating, which is what, you know, Matt was talking about. So we were looking around for uh, a way because we had been doing bone marrow as well. And so we found a device that we're able to pull bone marrow in a way that it pulls about 60 times more stem cells than what a traditional oh, procedure wow. would. So since we started using that method, our, our results have been infinitely better, infinitely faster, uh, quicker as far as the response level. Um, but I know, I know Matt used a lot of product on you, which is awesome, right? Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, th that's a factor. I know with, with some of the placental products, you have a certain amount that you can use, right? So when I'm looking at a, a case, you know, I'm looking at like what all I need to treat. And sometimes that's a, a thought process that I have and um, would lead me into bone marrow just from a cost point with a patient. But, right. you know, your, your case, um, you know, could have probably even been addressed with prolotherapy and ozone, but you might have been looking at multiple visits right? Or even with platelets and PRP. So sometimes the conversation is, you know, can I do a one and done for you, which is what Matt did for you. I mean, he did a one and done, like I'm anticipating like you're, this problem solved, right? Or is it something where we may need to do like one to three treatments or a series of 12 treatments? So that's a good one. And, and also then I just made a judgment I made a judgment, A, of what I was kind of going to do, and then you like the Grateful Dead, so I just said, we're going to get along great, <laughs> so I just went for it. Yeah. But then, interestingly, let's say let's say you came back and asked me the same question, so you can't do that, what would you do? So then, it like uh, to hydrodissect that psoas tendon, PRP or PRP plus some platelet pore plasma is a fantastic treatment for that. Now, it tends to be sore, and you were a little sore today, so it would have been more sore significantly. Oh wow! Yeah, because I was I was super sore last night. Yeah, much more than I which was expected. which was more than I expected too, because I almost never see that. But then this has been going on so long. Yeah. But if you said, like, it, just like what you said, John, I bet you that if I did PRP two or three times, you would totally love that. And I think a lot of the back stuff is just compensatory, and would kind of go away. And so. Any of the four or five things that we do for the low back, plus that would have been a great treatment. Mm -hmm. And then, um, interestingly, if we just started doing subcutaneous peptides and and had you starting to work myofascially, that psoas tendon, I bet you we could get an amazing result with that. Mm -hmm. And so then it's kind of cool to begin to say, oh, okay, so then if we could diagnostically come to clarity around what we think is going on, and then we, then we have so many different ways of working with this that, that and, and interestingly, like a lot of uh, emotional stuff also came up all of a sudden, which was like my favorite part. And so then we started doing Qigong and stuff like that. And so then all of a sudden you have a lot of a diversity of ways to sort of approach something. And even though you would love to think that it's one and done, a lot of times I'll do something, but then a lot of times the second time is like real minimal. Mm -hmm. Got it. So when, the booster. It, mm -hmm. when yeah. it comes to kind of what tool either of you want to choose uh, from what I'm hearing, some of that's going to be dependent on what someone can afford and and how much time they have right so in the spectrum of 
uh, of what you just described in the spectrum of least to most expensive would like prolotherapy be kind of at the lower end price wise and and what's that um yeah, kind I would of say, cascade of of cost because the insurance isn't covering this stuff yeah. because it works no. <laughs> I, I would say i would say prolo with dextrose and ozone would be kind of like ground floor at least in our clinic mm -hmm. and then you start to work into platelet rich plasma you know which is the next step and then you start to look at things like um amniotic material and placental material and bone marrow the exosomes these these tend to be you know more in the thousands when you get into those those stem, you know more stem cell uh, procedures got it would that be in alignment with your practice too matt mm -hmm. yeah. yeah do you guys see any possibility of this type of medicine to become as mainstream uh, where insurance would potentially cover these types of procedures or is it because it's not pharmaceutically driven it's just going to live in its own cash basis the the um a friend of mine um dr nazarian is a actually got a whole bunch of data and presented it to the insurance companies in his state for carpal tunnel because we do we all the time will do a hydrodissection where we'll put fluid around the median nerve to treat carpal tunnel and so then he presented it to the top three insurance companies and it worked and then they they said we um, have done a whole bunch of research and we found that people are afraid of surgery, but this doesn't look very scary. This looks super easy to do and we think utilization will go up and it'll cost us more. So mm -hmm. we're not going to yeah. pay for it. Yeah, because <laughs> oh, yeah, imagine if all of a sudden they made stem cells you know, available on the insurance. So if I, if I were to need a knee, knee you know, say I had bone on bone knee, right? And I had a choice to go get an injection or to have to go get a knee replacement. I mean, people are terrified to get a knee replacement, but there would be, you know, cattle, you know, cattle call with people wanting to go get that injection because, you know, there's no, there's no, the recovery, the downtime's almost, you know, nothing. But that, but that being said, like I, I was telling, I've been telling people this lately. I remember as clear as it was yesterday, I was, I was hanging out with these cardiac surgeons in Missoula, Montana, and there was a big cardiac institute and in Missoula, Montana, they did just like, and this is in 1993, uh, every hospital in America was doing three rooms, two or three open heart surgeries a day. And so they, the cardiac surgeons were like, you know, hey, kid, definitely go and we are the kings of this hospital. Everybody does what we say, and they did. And they were like, um, and, and so Jeff, def, definitely go into cardiac surgery and you'll be the coolest. So I, I <laughs> kind of had that, I was like, oh, okay, I'm definitely going to do this because they were like the guys. Mm -hmm. And then they said, just so you know, what's happening, you need to go spend one day with a cardiologist, but don't listen to him and come back down here. Cause we're the Kings. So it's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. So then we went up there and the, uh, the cardiologist, I still remember it was like it was yesterday. And he goes, they told you just to come up here and then not listen to me because they said they're the kings, right? And I looked at him, I was like, yeah. He goes, do you know what I'm doing right now? And then I go, what? He goes, I'm doing a stent. And uh, I go, oh, what's that? He goes, I'm opening up the coronary artery. He goes, I'm going to stop referring to those guys and they're going to all go out of business because nobody's going to do heart surgery anymore unless they have a valve, mm -hmm. which is fundamentally what happened. Mm. And so in my career, at the beginning, cardiac surgery ruled everything. And now they're walking around the hospital having coffee. Mm -hmm. And so then what I predict is this is the same thing. In 20 years, we're going to be doing percutaneous procedures. All of this stuff is going to be more effective than what's done now. Medicine evolves, and I think that medicine is going to fundamentally begin to adopt this stuff, and then we're going to start to we're starting to do clinical trials. Other people are going to do clinical trials, and we're going to have data, mm -hmm. and then that data is going to get better and better and better, and then we're going to be able to say, oh, okay, I'll compete with you on price, and people are just beginning to do this now. And so then, and so then for certain things like total knee replacement, then I'll compete with somebody on price, like yeah. I'll gamble. And, and, and because I think we probably beat them mm -hmm. and not a hundred percent of the time. And so then we're going to have to have these, we're going to have to classify and we're going to have 
different groups and we're going to say, okay, this group of patients for sure responds super well to pick a product, PRP, stem cells, mm -hmm. cell matrix. And so then the practice is going to evolve, but it's, it's, it always evolves to being less operation and more injection that is percutaneous, like a stent or with a needle. And so, and so I'm actually super optimistic, but it's just going to take a little time. I'm glad to hear that because it's people, people need access. You know, mm -hmm. that's the thing. I mean, this game now is, uh, is for the wealthy. You know what I mean? Yeah. If somebody really wants to go whole hog and insurance isn't going to cover the kind of procedure they want. I, I mean, I imagine so many people end up getting a hip or knee replacement or fuse their spine just because they can't afford or else they're just completely unaware that there's this whole other mm -hmm. way to do things. Right. Well, you know, if, you know, to your point, Matt, you know, it, I've been in this area of, 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 uh, health for so long, I've seen so much change. And back in the beginning years, you'd go to the conferences and there'd just be a handful of people, you know, now they're, 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 they're massive. You know, I mean, it has really hit, somewhat of a critical mass all over the world. You know, I mean, we used to, I remember when I would have a patient come in and we would talk to them about stem cells or PRP or whatnot. Um, and they would say, well, let me go talk to my orthopedic. And I would be worried because I'm thinking they're going to go to their orthopedic and their orthopedic's going to say, well, there's no research on that. It doesn't work. I wouldn't recommend you try that. Now, it's a different worry. I'm worried that I'm going to lose the patient because they're going to go to the orthopedic and say, oh, let us do it because now they're oh, all wow. doing it. Wow. And, and, then, and then I have to have the conversation with them, which we had kind of touched on it earlier about the art of prolotherapy. You know, both Matt and I, you know, we, we, we studied these, these arts using, you know, the, these injections where there's an, an understanding of the ligaments and being able to target these different areas of the body and treat all of the involved areas, you know, not thinking, oh, it's, it's, it's a this because it's hardly ever one spot, right? It's hardly ever one problem. It's usually what all is, you know, contributing to this pain. And so this is what's missing with the orthopedic uh, training is that they're trained to use steroids. And you could virtually just give an intramuscular steroid and you'll get a systemic effect. So they, they don't have to be accurate with these shots. Uh, you know, particularly where with things like placental matrix and bone marrow and stuff, you, you know, you're treating a rotator cuff injury or a labral tear, you got to be right on that. So I think one thing that people should really consider is, is not necessarily looking at the orthopedics as being the experts in this model, because this is a completely different skill set. It's a different, it's a different model, although these surgeons are good diagnosticians and they they understand orthopedics they may not be the right practitioner to go to for regenerative medicine if if regenerative practices uh, such as you guys are describing fail uh at what point would um, a knee or hip or shoulder replacement like one of those big joints when do you kind of hit the wall and go all right you know what you just the thing's trash you just got to get a new one is like how far will you go until you're like eh, can't help you well so so the, if you said i actually spent m most of my career almost my entire anesthesia career i spent doing ultrasound guided blocks to put the nerves to those joints asleep and then i did sedation for total joint replacement or orthopedic surgeries so i have a lot of experience with like they're kind of my brothers um and hip surgery, total hip replacement has been a long-term successful treatment. And mm -hmm. so, and hip replacement is the hardest or hip regenerative really bad medicine. degenerative hips mm -hmm. are the hardest thing for regenerative medicine to help. True. Um, if, if, I would say the last 10 people that came that were scheduled to have a shoulder replacement didn't need to have one. Like, mm -hmm. if I hear somebody needs a shoulder replacement, almost all the time, I think, oh, I can prevent that. Mm -hmm. And even like I ran into a, a, a guy and, and I was like, oh, didn't I see your dad? And he was like, oh, yeah, he needed a shoulder replacement 
but then he came to see you and you treated him and his shoulder's fine now. So it's kind of, it's the shoulders, knees is somewhere in between. Um, and so then we will try hard and then, but then it also, and this goes into the diagnostically trying to figure it out. So for example, sometimes people will have profound inflammation in the bone marrow uh, mm. of, of their femur. Yep. And so then that can cause pain. And it may be that you put something into the joint that's amazing, but they mm -hmm. still have bone marrow pain. Mm -hmm. um, as sometimes people can have profound buttressing and spurring of the, the bones on either side of that joint that pinch nerves. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are going to certainly be cases that are going to come to both of us, I'm going to say, mm -hmm. that we do our best and we can't prevent that. And so then... I, I think one one the thing is going to be to get better and better clarity in terms of how we stage and grade uh, severity, and then uh, how we figure out from a data perspective what works. And then just you know, kind of echoing John, my favorite treatment of all time was the, uh, the adipose stem cells. <laughs> You know, but then we're not doing, I'm not doing that either mm -hmm. uh, from a regulatory perspective, although I think it's just a totally fantastic mm -hmm. treatment. Um, and, and so sort of evolving, evolving into it. And, but I think it's going to be important for practitioners to, to lean further and further into diagnostically understanding what's going on to, to help have a clarity in terms of decision making and processing of how to how to process through that you know one thing that you had brought up is the intraosseous approach and i i don't think people are really talking about it because so there's there's giant leaps forward with regenerative medicine so you get to the point where you're like oh man this bone on bone knee is you know and it really you have to look at each patient and you have to say okay so this person has this you know, very injured joint or tissues. And as you get older, you know, you'll, there's, there's less demand on that. So, you know, you might have like an 85 year old grandmother comes in, she just wants to walk out and get her mail versus an athlete. So you're looking at those aspects, like, cause you can regenerate things to some extent, right? So younger people, they have a better ability to heal, you know, and, and grow new tissues, older people less so, but they're less active, right? So, you know, there had been this limitation to the amount of cartilage we could really produce and, and, and create. And late and, and, and over the last, I guess it's about three years now, there's been a big leap forward where we figured out that the, the bone underneath the cartilage was basically dead. And because of that, it's not supplying nutrients to the cartilage. And so there's an approach, and we use this in our practice, you know, so does doc, uh, Dr. Cook here, it, where it's actually an injection of um of of you know prp or sometimes you'll use stem cells into the bone just underneath the cartilage and it basically wakes that bone up and the bone can actually be painful as well you know some people may have you know deep joint pain that could be literally coming from the bone so that that seems to be a better um approach when it comes to more severe um uh, moderate to severe type of arthritic and what issues. are the limitations of manual therapy, body work? You know, I know so many people in, in my life have had various issues like mine and will go see some very talented practitioners and there's a temporary relief, but I, I don't often see a permanent fix. And a couple of things that come up a lot with that are uh, people have or think they have scar tissue and that you know if you get the right body worker they can get in there and break up scar tissue that's kind of a common thing and if, if we can only get to that then it's going to free this joint or whatever it is uh and then also kind of the myofascial release you know body workers that want to get in and work on the fascia which i've had incredible experiences with but nothing ever seems to produce for me in my experience and most people i know a fix where it's like wow worked with this body worker a bit things gone Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you think the limitation is there? And is, is the scar tissue around old injury sites and stuff, is that really a problem or is it just kind mm -hmm. of a cultural meme that we've all bought into? That's not really the thing. Oh no, it's very real, real. And you know, if you really want to have a holistic approach, I, you know, I feel like 
you have to have a strengthening pro- program. You know, there has to be muscular balance. There has to be flexibility. You know, people have to have proper gait or walking. You know, there's getting in and out of their car, you know, the way that they're operating and, you know, activities of daily living. You know, all of these things matter, right? Because these things are what are leading to the stress on the joint. So we, what, what these treatments that we're talking about, they're not a compensation for these phys- that type of physical medicine. In fact, they're complementary, you know? And so if you're someone that wants to live to 100 years old or beyond, you know, you're going to look at some of these limitations that are going to happen to your body due to the breakdown of the joints and the cartilage. Well, you can exercise so the cows come home, but you're not going to actually build and get that friction-free surface of that joint back. It's just not going to happen. Or the, the loose ligaments or the torn rotator cuff. I mean, something like 80% of every, you know, people by the time they're 65, they have a torn supraspinatus tendon. You know, and this is something that is easily fixed. You know, you stick a needle in, right into that tear. You put some platelets or you know some placental products, and it, you've got you know almost a brand new tendon. Now, the I like that, and so then that's a that's a big thing to kind of recognize because when when orthopedic surgeons found out that you what the way to make money if you're an orthopedic surgeon is buy it into a surgery center where you get part of the facility fee when you take somebody to get an outpatient orthopedic rotator cuff repair. So then every joint replacement surgery that surgeon that I knew that was 50 was trying to figure out how to do shoulder arthroscopy so that they could make money. That was like that era. Okay. So, but that there's probably no, that's one of the best things that responds to regenerative medicine. And the other thing for supraspinatus is if you treat the AC joint, a lot of times the AC joint uh, causes, uh, if it gets swollen and stretched and inflamed, it can impinge the supraspinatus. Mm -hmm. But when you think about myofascial stuff, it, if you go back to this diagnostic algorithm that we're talking about with ultrasound, some people have no nerve pain, but they've got myofascial stuff. Some people have really profound nerve pain. And I found if people have profound nerve pain, they don't do that well with myofascial treatments. Another thing that is a big cause of pain is, is, is vascular arterial issues. And sometimes there's a, a nerve component that relates to the autonerve, autonomic nervous system with it. Uh, and so sometimes when we do hydrodissection, I'll hydrodissect arteries. Sometimes I'll hydrodissect nerves. Often I'm, I'm hydrodissecting both because they're right by each other. And so then a person like, uh, that's just a normal person like me, like my entire life, I was totally focused on yoga and exercise and myofascial treatments. And I, I basically dedicated my life to that stuff because I thought that was going to be the source of my of healing myself. And I fundamentally couldn't do it. And so then I ended up going to regenerative medicine. Now, I still love myofascial stuff as much as I ever did. But then just, and interestingly, a lot of times if you start to fix that nerve pain, if you start to fix the myofascial stuff, a lot of times then you'll start to respond really well um, to manual therapies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I want I, I, I want to go back and hit the rewind rewind button there. I was in no way also insinuating that body work is not valid. And there right, are some right, incredibly right. talented people out there. It, I, I'm more speaking to like, huh? Is, I guess maybe that we're talking about root causes here. But mm-hmm. back to where you went, John, it's like the root root cause deep under the surface, perhaps, is that we're sitting like this most of our life. We're sitting at a desk, sitting in a car. We don't move as a natural human. If you Mm -hmm. think about the ancestral and functional movement scene, right? We all should be able to move like a leopard or a baby and, Mm -hmm. you know, have all of those ranges of motion and strength and flexibility. But because of our domesticated lifestyle, we don't. So I think that's kind of the piece where perhaps body work and functional movement comes in so that a guy like me doesn't fix this, you know, inflamed tissue or whatever we worked on and then just go back to sitting all day long. Yeah. I'm going to end up eventually probably in the same place or, you know, have another similar issue just from the dysfunction of the biomechanics being misused or underused. One of the, one of the things that Matt had brought up that it's like, you know, there, there, you have the function of the muscle and the range, you know, the range of motion flexibility, and then you have the, 
the quality of the joint itself, right? And the tissues. And you have to pay attention to both. If you don't, you're really missing out on, you know, uh, 50%. Um, so imagine if you were like a runner, right? And you ran a marathon, anybody that's done that, they wake up the next morning, you're going to be stiff, right? And sore. So you can imagine if that, that, that underlying joint tissue, you know, is, is chronically like that because it's damaged. You're, you're trying to stretch, you're trying to exercise, and you're going to have a lot of limitations to be able to get the most out of whatever rehab you're trying to do. So if you can only imagine if you address both at the same time, you're really getting the most complete treatment. Love that. Uh, explain to me, Matt, what you did with this woman, we, young girl, we promised to give her a shout out. Uh, mm. Ayala, I think was her name. <laughs> And you said, hey, guys, you know, come in. That One of my patients is, is cool if you guys, you know, want to come in the room and observe this procedure. It was a, a, a stelate ganglion. Am I pronouncing yeah, that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stellate. Stellate. Stellate yeah. ganglion. Could you describe that uh, and how that ties into the systemic relief of pain? Oh, okay. Oh, that's a good one. So, um there is one, we were talking about these different genres or categories of pain. And so then one thing would be like, uh, if you have a, a tendon and there's a little, there's always nerves around that tendon. And so then if you pu pulled that tendon, that, that nerve would tell you, ah, you just pulled a tendon and it super hurts. So, um, that's called nociceptive pain. Okay. Now then there's another type of, uh, thing that can happen, which is, let's say that for some reason, you you went into a fight or flight state, and then stayed in that state for a super long time. And that might be it in an, an artery, or that might be in like, for example, an arm or a leg. And, and then the that part of the body is stuck in fight or flight. Fight or flight causes your your all of your blood vessels to squeeze so that your blood pressure is high. But then if you stay in a squeezed tight position, then over time it causes you to not get enough blood flow to tissues. And then if, if uh, normally we cycle between relax and fight or flight, and so normally there's just kind of a, a balanced homeostasis between those. But sometimes if you get stuck in fight or flight, one example of that would be PTSD Another example of it is this condition that I treat a lot called complex regional pain syndrome, where a part of the body is stuck in fight or flight. And another one is sometimes people with migraine headaches, well, there's a, a component of people, and also for head pain and face pain, uh, what will happen is, is the, the, the blood vessels are stuck in a chronic fight or flight state and they never release. And so then what, uh, what we do is I, I do an injection uh, and I go uh, in the front of the neck right to where the fight or flight nerves are. And then I put them to sleep for like eight hours. And so then when I put them to sleep and I also treat the vagus nerve, which is the rest and relax nerve. So I, I basically take rest and relax and fight or flight and basically put them to sleep. And then what that does is it causes them to shut down. And then when they wake back up, they tend to wake back up kind of at the factory default settings. Mm -hmm. And so that can be helpful for people in terms of resetting because now that's going to reset basically the balance between rest and relax and fight or flight to the arteries or wherever we're, we're trying to do that for them. It was really interesting watching her uh, go through that experience. She was a trooper, but she's the patient's lying there watching the ultrasound monitor. Mm -hmm. I'm watching that. And then you have, I mean, not a thick gauge needle, but a pretty long needle deep in her neck. And she's just hanging out. And I thought that was so interesting. And you later explained that you don't really have pain receptors much inside there. It's more on the surface of the skin. Because I was like, how is this girl not jumping off the table? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. But it's a, from a big picture to think about how that works, basically we're hanging out basically in my kitchen. <laughs> and what happens is all of our senses, so our, our taste, smell, hearing, vision, are mapping into this part of the brain called the amygdala. And so at every second, 
our amygdala is just is constantly screening to make sure that this is not fight or flight. Mm -hmm. So then if everything is cool, now we're just in this kind of great conversation, everything's rest and relax and it's cool. Now, if you smelled something that was burning, you could, you're, that might be a signal that it was fight or flight, but your consciousness could suppress that because your consciousness could say, oh, Barb's just making toast for us. So everything's fine. She just burned the toast. That's kind of funny. And so then we'd still be in rest and relax and it's super cool. But th the same thing could trigger fight or flight. Now, if fight or flight is triggered, then what happens is the amygdala, I call it crazy Amy, projects out and it goes through these nerves and there's three big ganglion that the nerves kind of it's like basically kind of the grand central station for the fight or flight nervous system is in the neck and then they send branches that go to the arteries and they can either cause you to squeeze or relax now what happens is a lot of times somebody is goes to afghanistan or they get trauma or they get assaulted something happens and then let's say it happens again, and then it happens again. All of a sudden, you begin to have an idea. I don't know when this fight or flight is ever going to stop. And so then the, what will happen is the brain will get stuck in a loop where it stays in fight or flight all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's our definition of PTSD. And that could happen and from, for a PTSD reason. It can happen with anxiety. And then the other thing that can happen is if you're in pain all the time, sometimes you get stuck in that state. So then the super interesting thing is, is that we look with the ultrasound and then I put a needle into the sternocleidomastoid, which doesn't hurt at all because muscle having a needle on muscle. I go over the nerves that I used to block when I was treating shoulders. Uh, I go over the, the brachial plexus and then I go right next to the carotid artery into a plane in between two muscles and it's the two deepest muscles in the front of your neck so it's pretty interesting right by your spine called longus coli and longus capitis and then i just use numbing medicine and i open that plane up and so you just see a beautiful sort of opening interestingly a lot of times that helps reset those muscles and people will feel better but then uh, that is right where those nerves that came from crazy, from the amygdala, from Crazy Amy, are. Mm -hmm. And so when you turn them off, it's kind of a reboot or a reset. And it was actually, be, I fell in love with this procedure so much that I actually named my company after it, Bioreset. Mm -hmm. and, and more oh. after the concept of a reset. Yeah. And why did one of her eyes... Uh, pupils dilate so much and the other one not it's like kind of a bell's palsy sort of yeah. situation she had going on my friend sean tyranny says that it's a one out of ten for uh pain and a, a nine out of ten for weird <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. reminded there's this one photo of david bowie where his i mean he had kind of different colored eyes yeah. but there's a very famous photo where one pupil's huge and the other one's Mm -hmm. uh, not it's really strange you don't see that often in people yeah so so then we put them to sleep and so you can imagine if this was a fight or flight situation i would open my eyes wide awake so therefore if i turned fight or flight off that eye gets droopy and so then if this was a fight or flight situation i would open up my pupils real wide to see everything but if this is rest and relax I go down. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the pupil gets small, the eye gets droopy. If this was a fight or flight situation, I would need to breathe through this nose. I would have to open it all the way up so I could run. Mm -hmm. But if it's rest and relax, it gets congested. Mm -hmm. So then when I do it, like within about 30 seconds or a minute, you saw it only took about 30 seconds. All of a sudden the eye gets droopy, the, um, the, 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 uh, your eye gets real red, the pupil gets small, you can't breathe through this nose. And then the nerve that goes to your voice box uh, is, uh, is running with the vagus nerve, which is this, the main rest and relax nerve. And so then that goes up, it's called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. That we block, especially if I do a vagus nerve hydrodissection. So the voice gets hoarse. And then the other thing that happens is, is that relaxes um the tight squeeze 
on the blood vessels that go to your brain. So you get more blood flow. So sometimes you get a little bit of a headache afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I always do. But then what happens afterwards is all of that gets reset. And interestingly, like my voice, after I did it on both sides, my voice gets better. And then sometimes we'll use other products other than numbing medicine. And interestingly, I'm finding that there's a lot that can happen in terms of improving people's voice, their ability to sing and stuff like that. You know, I, I, I think this is such an important topic, you know, and, um, you know, Matt and I share a friend, Sean Mulvaney, that did some just incredible research with PTSD in the, mm-hmm. in the military. The yeah. And he's an amazing guy. Hi, Sean. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I've heard him lecture on this and this procedure is absolutely amazing. And to be able to go in and, and reset. And so it's a treatment that lasts, right? So you go in, you do, and you have this reset to the, the sympathetics. So the sympathetics is this fight or flight. You've got the parasympathetics that's opposite, just like your glute and your psoas, right? You have that reciprocal inhibition, just like that weak glute is causing that psoas to be hyper-contracted. The same thing happens when you have a weak parasympathetic nervous system. You get this hyper-responsive sympathetic. And that's basically, I think, one of the biggest problems we have, we face right now. Everybody's, there's too much stress. Like how many people do you know that has too much rest and relaxation. You know, it just doesn't happen. Um, one of the things that we are, we're using clinically that we're seeing some really good effects with balancing the sympathetics is high dose melatonin. Because it's one of the, the primary activators and supporters of the parasympathetic nervous system. And, and if you think about it, it makes sense. You've got this circadian rhythm, you go into sleep, right? And this is where you rest and regenerate. This is where you're completely parasympathetic. Then you wake up cortisol, which is the primary activator of the sympathetics. And this is the problem. When you, when you have this stress response, you think your life is in jeopardy. You've got cortisol that kicks in, you know, and, and cortisol is destructive to a lot of hormones. You know, it's bad for your gut. Um, doing a, a treatment like this uh, stellate ganglion block is, is, is just incredible because people can have improvements to their gut. Um, people can have better brain function because they're, when you're sympathetic, you, ha- you don't have the, as good a circulation you know, to your brain. So there's a lot of problems with degenerative neurologic disease uh, long term. I mean, even just the consequence of poor sleep from having overactive sympathetics and what that leads to with just almost all diseases. You could look at almost every single disease and say that if the sleep is bad, the disease is going to be made worse. If you get the sleep better, that person's disease process is going to improve. When you do this procedure, uh, is it typically done on both sides on, on different days? So a lot, a lot of times I will do both sides and sometimes I'll do one side and let people integrate that experience and then I'll do the other side. The right side tends to be a little bit more resetting fight or flight and trauma. The left side, often people will have more improvements cognitively in terms of, in, in terms of thinking. Um, the, I, I'm going to try some high dose, I'm going to try your high dose melatonin along with this because that first night's a rocky night Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it it may be the best idea i've ever heard to take a high dose melatonin suppository Mm -hmm. uh that night and it it might even be a really great thing because the nervous system's more susceptible to other good influences that you give it Mm -hmm. um and then from kind of a like we were talking at dinner last night about consciousness and Yes, it's interesting. In fight or flight is a great state to be in, especially when you're young and you don't have any anxiety. So fight or flight is fun and it's exciting. And if you have any ADHD, you don't even have to worry about it because you're going to be fully concentrating. I remember that was part of the appeal of anesthesia to me. Like if somebody's dying down the hall, you don't have to, there's no consideration of whether or not you want to do it. You just run into the room and do what you have to do. But then that sort of genre of living your life eventually becomes fairly overwhelming. And interestingly, it's not super effective. And so then 
finding a way to kind of start to run a rest and relax algorithm and have a better ability to kind of go back and forth between fight or flight and rest and relax, I think is what we're all looking for. Mm -hmm. And so then, and, and sometimes I think that it doing the block teaches your brain how, how, Oh, okay. I can go into that state. Like when I do, I was telling um, John, I love, I do five or six every day. And it's my favorite thing to do because then I just go at, it's super low stress because I do it so much. And so then I walk in and it's like, okay, everything's going to be amazing. I just kind of connect and get in heart space. And then it's like my favorite thing to do. And so then what I feel like is that we're learning through these medical procedures, how to be in a clear conscious state, Mm -hmm. but then the medical procedure is just like a, uh, a gimmick that is encouraging us and kind of helping us. But the reality is, and this has been my belief from the beginning, is that that we don't need that. This is, and it, the, um, I, I always say, once I get really good, I'm not going to need to do that anymore, even though I totally love doing it. And when do you decide whether or not to incorporate the uh, hydrosection of the vagus nerve? Um, what it's, it's interesting. What happens is you'll do, you'll do something when like in your practice and then you'll fall in love with doing that. And then you'll, you'll make a change. Somebody else, I'll call Sean Melvaney or Sean Tierney is another friend of mine who knows a lot about ultrasound. And then we'll argue back and forth and talk about it. So like there, we're having a conversation now of, doing a double stellate, so one at C6 and one at C4 on the same day. Uh, we're, we're, what I am currently doing that I like the most is I, I go at C5, and I, there's a fascial plane that opens perfectly for me there, and I do the, the stellate and the vagus at the same time, oh, and I wow. just do it at, in one 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 fell swoop and then I'll have them come back for the other side. Got so, it. so it's, it's a, it's a continually evolving thing. And so w- what you'll do is you'll do, you know, two or three or four or 500 and then, and then talk and evolve and listen to, you know, conversations like this and have an idea like, Oh, I wonder what would happen if I gave my high dose melatonin like that. Mm-hmm. That's like a, like a lightning bolt for me. So it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we we both went to Dis- Joe Dispenza, right? And yeah. he talks about the, you know, high beta, right? When that's that you're in a sympathetic state, you're focused on a single point, right? And that's what how most people are operating all day long. And you know, Matt was talking about con- you know consciousness, and we all want to be more present in the moment. And that's really where we're moving more towards that parasympathetic. The more we can be in that parasympathetic state the more we're going to really completely be appreciating the moment, which is all we're ever going to have. The more we're in the sympathetic state, it's taking us away from that present moment. We're looking, you know, single point of the, one of the things that Dispenza has us do in our meditations is look and consider the space around your body, right? Where it's, you're broadening out your focus and that actually changes the brain waves to more alpha, you know, and it's, it's, you're, you're lowering them. Right. It's kind of taking you out of that survival, um, myopic awareness of of the body and your immediate surroundings where it's scanning for danger or benefit. Mm -hmm. Now that's really interesting. Uh, How does the skull and jaw play into all this? I know you do work on people's cranium. You you ballooned me out in Austin, which was really incredible. And a couple unsuspecting friends of mine who really actually enjoyed the benefits of it. And Mm -hmm. we were chatting a little bit yesterday, yesterday about TMJ how does uh, you know the neck up kind of relate since we're in that area already from from either of you? I guess starting with you, John. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I I do very unique forms of cranial uh, treatment, but w- where we use endonasal balloons. So the cranium is uh, a bunch of bones, and they move, and where they come together are similar to what the joint that your tooth fits into your jaw, right? And so they actually can move. And if you look a hundred years ago. 
people didn't have to have their wisdom teeth removed. And so what's happening is the cranium is, is, getting, is getting more narrow and we have more crowding of the teeth. And so things get jammed. The maxillary bones kind of sink in. And so it alters the, um, the, uh, the position of the jaw because your jawbone, your mandible is one bone. It's not going to move. But the uh, temporal bones that fit the TMJ, they can change and move. So what we do in my clinic is, and this is a good example of how we talked about function and, and the, you know, the integrity of the tissues. So when people start um, developing TMJ, often you have a, a malalignment of that joint that then stresses the tissues, which often there's this disc that then gets migrated forward and stretched and damaged. And then there's the capsule of the joint itself. And so there's damage to that joint and it hurts, right? And so what we do is we realign the cranium and oftentimes just using the, the functional cranial release, people will notice that their jaw stops clicking stops clicking and it feels better. And so then we'll go in with something like, I, I find typically that platelets work really well for fibrocartilage, which is mostly, you know, the structural damage of the TMJ. So oftentimes we would start with something like that with a platelet rich plasma injections in the jaw. And it's, it's very rare that we see patients that don't respond really well to that. Wow, I think it's so interesting when I interviewed um, Dr. Dean Howell mm -hmm. that I, I know you're aware of, uh, it never quite landed with me that the skull is a bunch of bones. Yeah. I think many of us think of the skull as just one solid bone that holds your brain. It's an it's a interesting concept that it is designed to move, right? And there's yeah. ligaments and tendons all around the head that are supposed to naturally work um, in, in unison, right? And work mm -hmm. with one another and that flexibility. I think that's so interesting. Yeah. One thing I noticed from uh, the endonasal balloons that you put up my nose, um, and I experienced this with Dr. Howe too, is just this, maybe it's blood flow. I don't know you could explain, but it's just this mental clarity. It's like the best nootropic, mm -hmm. you know, for a couple of days after it's just like, whoa, everything's very clear, you know, just very centered, mm -hmm. kind of uh, able to hold more than one thing in mind. And I don't know, just like a real flow state, I guess that's yeah. the word I'm looking for. Well, you know, going back to that concept of you're either a swamp or a river, right? Mm -hmm. So cranial rhythm is a movement pattern that moves cerebral spinal fluid. And so cerebral spinal fluid carries oxygen and neurotransmitters and nutrients that the brain and spinal cord need. So every 12 hours, actually, your cerebral spinal fluid is supposed to flow, you know, the entire length of the spinal cord and around the, the brain. So, you know, but it does get stuck in areas. And so it's not just the cranial bones, but there's, there's something called the dura mater that's inside of the, the cranium. And it extends down the spinal cord, wraps around all the different areas of the brain, and it actually becomes the whites of the eye. And it's very, very dense. And dura mater means tough mother in Latin. Mother because it's kind of protecting, you know, something so important, your, your central nervous system. And, um, and you get adhesions to these structures. And it could happen from the birthing process, or it could happen from head injuries, or it could happen from postural distortions. And so what happens when we go in there and do these different manipulations and these adjustments is we're releasing these adhesions and we're restoring the cranium to a more wide position. People breathe better. You know, it, it has a very powerful uh, influence on the vestibular system. So one of the things I do, I'm a functional neurologist. And so we see a lot of patients with neurological um, conditions and we, we use the balloons and we, we adjust their cranium it allows their, their brain to work better. And then we go in with very specific functional exercises to balance using something called neuroplasticity. And, you know, this almost, this, this conversation is almost as, um, in my mind, monumental as the conversation we had about orthopedics. You're talking about actually fixing the problem. If you, if you have someone that has a neurological problem and you give them a drug, that's why nobody can, you know, they can't, they can't find any drugs for like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, really. I mean, as far as fixing it. So when you give a drug, it's global. It's going to be a global activator or a global inhibitor. But, you know, if I were to say, I'm going to give you a pill so that you know what a strawberry tastes like, it's like, that's impossible, right? But if you take one taste of a strawberry, you know, for the rest of your life, what it tastes like. So the nerves are fired, right? And certain nerves, and it's, it's a complex kind of symphony. 
And so this is the same thing that happens with neurological situations is you have to activate those specific um, pathways. You know, there's never going to be a drug that's going to fix a lot of these problems ever. Wow. The, the, I'll give a, a shout out. I actually, I love functional neurology. And so that was like one of the first, one of my first forays into kind of understanding chiropractic medicine. And then I studied uh, pretty extensively with a guy named, do you know Andy Barlow? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah he's oh, the yeah. greatest. It's like he's <laughs> yeah, functional he's in neurology. New Orleans like a, or and, Louisiana. And Tup- yeah. he loves, he's in Tupelo, Mississippi. Okay, right. So right. I kept flying down to Tupelo. Yeah. So, but uh-huh. It was the birthplace of Elvis. So I was like, no problem. I'll go to, I'll go to <laughs> Tupelo. So awesome. Yeah. And, and it's, an, it's a, a slightly different worldview. But then if you took 100% of what is taught in functional neurology, I think it would be in integrity with basically the neurology that I learned in medical school. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of exercises and things that people are given to sort of reset the stuff. And so I'm, I'm a big fan. Mm-hmm. What about uh, the topic of peptides? I know this is something that's been kind of emerging. And Matt, you were telling me that from a regulatory standpoint, they're kind of in, in limbo a bit. Do Have either of you had great success with them? And if so, which ones? And, and where do you see that going? Are we going to have to leave the country at some point to to work with these? Well, I know Matt has a lot more experience in this, but I can tell you personally, I've had phenomenal results with it. Um, We've used them in in the practice as well. Um, I've been, you know, my eyes have been opened a bit to, um, uh, you know, in conversations with Matt as far as the, the, some of the potential of some of the other varieties of peptides. But I, I've always thought it was the, the medicine of the future. I mean, looking at how these peptides are starting to um, come on board and then now how they're beginning to be um, discriminated against and, and the target of the FDA to shut them down when it's such a, a pure medicine. You know, it was, it was first developed in Russia from what I understand, in Russia, they, they were basically like, you know, United States, screw you. You know, you got all the pharmaceutical. We're going to have our own deal. And so they started to really research these peptides. And I think ultimately they work more complementary with the body. Like, for instance, the growth hormone releasing peptides, instead of taking growth hormone, these growth hormone releasing peptides get you to produce your own growth hormone. Or BCP-157, which is naturally produced in the stomach, where if you get an ulcer, this, this peptide would be there to help heal that ulcer up really quick. But it happens to also heal up a lot of the other parts of your body, which kind of, kind of aligns with, you know, I, when you talk to people in Chinese medicine, they'll say, stomach is everything. You have a strong stomach, you're completely strong overall, right? They call it stomach fire right? And so when you start looking at BCP, it starts to become really fascinating on how powerful that one peptide can be just for general health and vitality. Yeah. We're, if, if I only had one modality and you said, I'm going to take everything away and you can only have one thing, then I would keep peptides. Wow. Damn. And you know, I, I, co-founded some it's something called international peptide academy and so we're we're doing a lot of teaching um a, around this the the most famous peptide in the world just to kind of give you a little insight is insulin mm-hmm. so 30 million people a day inject peptides into their body or have pumps that inject peptides into their body to help manage diabetes and so we have little small signaling molecules that communicate something and so mm-hmm. a cell might secrete a peptide or it might secrete another molecule and that that uh molecule is kind of like a little thought bubble that says hey how are you doing could you do me a favor and go fix that tendon and so mm-hmm. then that's a little thought bubble that i could send over to you and and then you could do that and that thought bubble might be an exosome it might be a peptide it might be another another molecule and so then within peptides, there's a, a real big diversity of different types of, of peptides that do different things. But generally, these are, these are all just molecules that we make in our own body uh, that are a sequence of amino acids. 
And so then I could uh, take and have a reactor where I just put amino acids together in the right order, and then you can synthesize and make these. So, uh, and they tend to be extremely stable. And so then what happens is the peptides are mailed to someone and then that, and they're either in a lyophilized form or a liquid form. And then someone uses an insulin syringe, which has a tiny, tiny needle, and then they inject it. So there are some peptides that help um, with immune function. And I think part of the controversy on peptides now is a lot of people were using peptides in and around COVID. And so there's, there's, that's just a topic. Um, the, right. um, there's some peptides that tend to be very um, anti-inflammatory. One of the best ones is the BPC-157 that John was mentioning, and then thymus and beta-4, which is also an immune, immune peptide. And these, it's, it's, it's an evolving uh, process. And um, I'm not going to say too much because uh, we're not going to know how all of this is going to fall out until probably when this podcast comes out in a couple months. Um, there are some peptides that are quite helpful at stimulating and improving the way that mitochondria function. And, and then there's uh, these peptides that uh, will help your body release growth hormone. And so then they're very helpful for body composition change. And, and at this point... I think you basically just about have to be crazy to take growth hormone. Like anybody in mm -hmm. the world taking growth hormone, yeah, I, I to think about getting off of that and switching to these the peptides. And so then, by the way, what's your favorite stack for as a growth hormone releasing? Well, so it's, and so then this one's kind of controversial too because there's some um, there's some patent issues with this. But if 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 you just said all all takers. Mm -hmm. um, Tessa Morellin mm -hmm. is uh, fantastic, and and uh, and you can have a combination of, of Tessa Morellin and Ipa Morellin. Mm -hmm. and, and so I like that, uh, and I like that before working out in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The um, the it, there's the classic one that almost everybody does is CJC and Ipa Morellin, mm -hmm. and so there's a, a stack where you could do uh, Tessa Morellin. Uh, maybe with EPA in the morning, CJC and Epimoralin in the afternoon. Mm. And then uh, in the evening, uh, the, you, you can do, uh, and there's a, a formulation where you can take uh, IGF, LR3, uh, uh, TESA, or I mean CJC and Epimoralin. So you do that, that combination. Mm. And so that's actually a pretty nice stack. Um, but then what I do with all of the growth hormone secretagogues is I'm cycling through. And mm. so I never have people on the same thing permanently. And so then I'll do, do one sequence and then I'll, I'll switch that up and we'll try something else. Mm. And so then kind of seeing how they respond and then just, just like working out a diversity of approaches tends to be better. Are, are there, uh protocols that you're finding better results with like say like lime and mold or people with just biotoxin illness okay so then one thing is is that the growth hormone secretagogues can trigger problems for people with lime and mold mm -hmm. and so then what uh what i would say is that for the lime and mold people the the best thing to do is to start with um just the immune peptides mm -hmm. and and interestingly, within Lyme and mold, then the two big the the two big kind of avant garde things that are happening is people can get uh, mast cell activation, which is like almost like an allergic type of reaction to a variety of substances, or they can get postural orthostatic hypotension, where they can get either low blood pressure or high heart rate or both. Mm -hmm. And so these are these are things that a lot of patients with complex illness mm -hmm. will present with. Mm -hmm. And so then what happens is on the Lyme mold conversation, then I try to get an assessment of, okay, are those things going on? And then are they sensitive? Mm -hmm. Now then, if that's the case, traditionally by far the best thing to start with has been thymus and alpha one. Mm -hmm. And it seems that from a regulatory perspective in the United States, that's probably going to go away. That's a shame. Um, which is, I, I think that that's probably a shame. Mm -hmm. um, then the next one is 
thymus and beta four. Mm-hmm. Uh, all indication is that's probably going to go away too in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, next, and of course, the BCP one fifty seven. So BPC one fifty seven is tends to be great. It's not really an immune. It mm-hmm. promotes angiogenesis. So so it does a lot of good things, very good for anti-inflammatory. Mm-hmm. BPC TB4 and uh, is is the one of the most amazing approaches for myofascial pain. Mm-hmm. And I think that's because there's an immune component to a lot of pain. Because mm-hmm. so it's a I great agree. question that I didn't yeah. get into when you said, oh, what are these categories of pain back in the beginning of the conversation? Mm-hmm. So I think that a lot of, and, and so then think about Lyme disease and chronic mold. A lot of those patients have peripheral neuropathy. Yeah. And so then interestingly, Probably one of the greatest treatments in the world for peripheral neuropathy is to hydrodissect all of those nerves with thymus and beta four and BPC one five seven. But the, I mean that's just going to go by the wayside in the states mm-hmm. for for now. But so then to, to approach those people, I try to go very cautiously, and I for those people, I don't put them on the growth hormone secretagogues. There's going to be some new things that are going to come out, thymulin and some other immune peptides are going to come. So it's going to be an, an evolution to see what happens with that. Mm-hmm. The Lyme and complex illness patients respond really well to mitochondrial peptides. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Mm-hmm. And so then that's, I, I think that that's probably a home run because then you start to give them more energy mm-hmm. and and they feel better and that's stimulating immune function. Well, you know, it, it makes sense because biotoxin illness, you've got this toxic just you know toxins are being bombarded fat soluble toxins into the cell membrane and you've got all these cytokines and so what's really going to get choked off is the mitochondria because it's going to go into that uh, you know aerobic glycolysis which was like 10 percent of the energy that it would normally create and and that's one of the things that just uh, i'm so excited to be in the middle of you know this whole melatonin super physiological melatonin because it actually works at that level and, and I really see a huge benefit of combining things, things like peptides and some of the, the work that we're doing with the melatonin because, you know, you're, you're able to get at the mitochondria and, and actually fix it. And then, of course, you know, various detoxification protocols, you know, are, are super important. So then it's a good one because I was thinking about you. Um, so there's a peptide that can help for sleep. Delta sleep inducing peptide. Mm-hmm. It's not like a super great long term mm-hmm. peptide. Um, the uh, epitalon is one of the Russian bioregulator mm-hmm. peptides mm-hmm. that you talked about. And then that, uh, and so there's a lot of people that will use that as an approach for um, short term high dose mm-hmm. cycles, maybe a couple times a year. But then you can use that in low dose. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, in low dose, uh, in low dose or high dose is quite helpful for sleep. But interestingly, low dose of that for sleep can be very beneficial. And so then I was thinking, you know, you were coming and I was kind of thinking about this and and meditating on it. And and I think that there's going to be a super interesting combination where you're starting to use some of the stuff that you have suppository wise and tell, tell people about that because, and, and, and the role of the suppository Mm -hmm. in terms of how melatonin goes into the bloodstream and, and, and that time course, Mm -hmm. because a, I think that that's super interesting. And then B, and then to think about layering on something at a peptide level that helps induce sleep. Mm -hmm. And then now your, your suppository is maintaining that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, what we were talking about the other day is that, you know, I was looking at all the research and, you know, these, these researchers was like, you know, well, melatonin supplementation helps sleep latency so you can go to sleep but it's not helping with all these other issues right and it's because when you take it orally there's something called peak plasma so any pill that you take orally you take it and for about an hour and this happens with ivs unfortunately as well unless it's a really slow drip is you've got like it's in the bloodstream for a certain period of time and then it's gone so the cells have this moment where they can pull it into the cell which is where you want the nutrient and then it's gone and they don't have that you know that available to them anymore so what a suppository does is it slow releases uh, a substance over the course of you know three four five or even seven hours 
And so this is a, a, a really good advantage for really any nutrient. I mean, CoQ10, um, uh, NAD, you know, this is one of the suppositories that we're making is um, NAD Max. And By the uh, way, the, your NAD suppository changed my life, especially flying, mm-hmm. which I've told you, but to tell the audience, and, and not to interrupt, but I want to let the audience know, by the time this comes out, I don't know the episode number, but there already will have been a long form conversation with you, John, about all of that, but carry yeah. on. Yeah, so so we did a pretty deep, back. We, we did a deep dive on the suppositories, no, no pun intended. We also dove deep into how melatonin works with the mitochondria, so we, we don't need to like repeat all that. But, but carry on with the, yeah. the blood plasma levels. I think that's really interesting to get a, a prolonged kind of slow release of whatever nutrient you happen to be using. That's really fascinating. Yeah, so um, a slow release is is really beneficial. You know, so if you wanted to go get an NAD IV, you might have to sit there for you know five or eight hours, and it costs fifteen hundred dollars. Where you know we have a suppository that has virtually the same dosage, and you know you put it in and you just off with your day. You don't even know it's there. Um, with melatonin, oral melatonin is two and a half percent absorbable. This is in the research. So it, not much is even getting in because you have first pass through the liver, you have your digestive enzymes, and, um, and, and so not much makes it into the bloodstream to begin with. And then what's left is there in a peak plasma for a short period of time, where when you do a suppository, you're, you're, you're skipping the digestive juices and you're skipping the first pass through the liver. It's going directly into the bloodstream and slowly over a period of time. So the cells have the time to get and draw those in like if you were to have like a bowl of beans and you pour water into them and you know you come back an hour later and you look at the beans you know they're probably going to look about the same they're still going to be hard right but you come the next day after a full 24 hours and they're starting to really absorb all that water and that's how your cells are your cells don't suck things in very quick you know they're they're, they need time to absorb it if i if i could give like the you know there's I always loved that song when I was a kid. I'd like to buy the world a Coke. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> I would like to not buy the world a Coke. But like yeah. we, we were talking about addiction yesterday. And, and if one takeaway that I'll give people is everybody with addiction is super depleted in NAD. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I was one of the relatively early people doing a lot of NAD IVs for addiction, but then it's like fly across the country and spend $10,000 getting, and so I'm trying to evolve into new ways to do that. Mm-hmm. I think the, the NAD suppository is a home run yeah. for, for addiction because all of a sudden, mm-hmm. if people have a little bit of energy and they're feeling better, they're mm-hmm. less susceptible to fall off the wagon in search of something that's gonna help them self-medicate. Yeah. None of those people can sleep. And mm-hmm. so then I think the idea of, of melatonin mm-hmm. in that population is a super great idea Big time. and then i'll just throw it out there even though we think from a regulatory perspective that this may go away in my experience thymus and beta-4 is for addiction mm-hmm. and thymus and peptides in general and i think it has an effect of detro- de- detoxing something in the central nervous system mm-hmm. can be profoundly helpful yeah. if you said what dose would i be thinking about i'd be thinking about kind of a traditional dose like 1.5 milligrams a day mm-hmm. some people will do a bolus once a week at a little bit higher dose maybe three or six milligrams mm-hmm. and 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 uh, and then there's a hundred other things in those genres, but if you did those three things, mm-hmm. I bet you might be surprised at how helpful it is. And you know, I was I was uh, telling Luke, like I just started calling my friends during COVID who were drinking too much and saying, "Hey, why don't you try this?" Mm-hmm. And everybody stopped drinking. Yeah. And so I mm. uh, I think it's a super. I think it's super interesting. It's almost like a social justice topic yeah. um, that we need to do more to mm-hmm. help people in a functional way sort of get through some of those struggles. Well, I think, I think, you know, the addiction is, is a huge topic and I, I think we should talk a little bit more about it. And, you know, what, what happens when you're drinking, you're not sleeping well. You know, they, they've shown that you're not getting REM sleep. So when you go into REM, this is when, all the things that happen throughout that day, your brain is basically defragging. You're making sense of things, right? 
So, you know, I have a friend that, that, you know, I, I, I knew in high school, right. And, and this person is literally the same as they were in high school. They just haven't matured. And that's what you'll see with people that are drinkers in yeah, particular. Absolutely. Is because they're not getting the sleep, particularly the REM, but they're also not getting deep sleep. Now, deep sleep in particular, it's one of the primary activators of something called the glymphatic system, which is where your brain actually detoxes itself. So, you know, using things like the, the, the thymus and beta to curb the, 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 the cravings, right? And, and also things like NAD, where you're going to feel more social, you're going to feel better about yourself. You know, you can use these tools, you know, that you're learning listening to this uh, podcast. And, and if you really pay attention to your sleep, because you ha- if you've been, if, you know, you know who you are if you're watching this, obviously. Um, if, if you haven't been sleeping for a long time and you actually start to get this sleep wi- dialed in, you will not believe how much better you feel. Like literally it, it, it will be transformational. You start getting some NAD on board. You start, you know, if you can find some, um, thymus and beta, you know, that, that just sounds like, you know, the trifecta to me. That's a good one. Yeah. I want to. Uh, before we wrap up here, because we're just about out of time, because uh, we have a lot of festivities planned <laughs> today too. I'm like, man, I'm looking at the clock. Oh, it's uh, time is wearing on, um, and I could talk to you guys forever, or even just listen. I think this is the quietest I've ever been in one of my podcasts because I'm just like absorbing so much. Uh, but I did want to circle back to, you know, physical pain and overcoming these uh, structural injuries and whatnot. And to what degree does the role of unhealed emotional trauma play in that do you find that you, at times you throw everything with the kitchen sink at someone's physical problem and that you suspect that there's some deep underlying ptsd or mm-hmm. emotional trauma that's preventing the final threshold from being crossed when it comes to healing the physical body well there's so many different stressors that that can cause an adaptation response in the body right and so physical adaptation responses are, are common. I mean, we had a patient in the clinic the other day that had a locked occiput and Matt walk, came in and said, Hey, you know, the chiropractor and, you know, I'm licensed here. So we, we did an adjustment on her occiput and, um, and, and it was great for her. Right. And then he did the stellate ganglion block to just downregulate because the sympathetics being, um, fired up, it causes, there's, there's actually a joint in the foot and both foot, this, uh, this, uh, I forget the name of this doctor's name, but he discovered the occiput, you know, the very first, um, joint between the skull and the, and the spine and, um, and, and the, and the ankles, we store emotions in those. And there's actually something called injury recall technique. I was actually going to show this to you at the clinic. Um, and, and, and I was, I was considering doing it with you where you can literally pinch over an area that's basically sympathetic, you know, because you have that vascular compromise and you've got pain, you pinch over it and you're, you're attracting inter, um, attention by the body. And then you'll go in and you'll actually, you'll change these joints to bring them the opposite direction that they want to go. And I've seen some just amazing things um, shift with, with just that. Yeah. Awesome. How about you, Matt? Well, that, and interestingly, if you think about it, the, the nerve input to the superficial skin over a joint ultimately meets up with the same nerve that goes to the joint. Mm-hmm. And we need the nerve to the skin and the nerve to the joint to meet up with each other so that when you, so that you have good coordination between the skin and the joint. Mm-hmm. So then there's all, tons of therapies aimed at kind of resetting superficial things on the skin mm-hmm. that actually can be moderately helpful for resetting things at, at a deeper level. And that goes from neural, everything. Neural prolo. That's, it's like a whole nother subject we could <laughs> dive exactly, into exactly. for another hour. Yeah. And, and so, and, but then interestingly for me, it all comes back. We did like this, you know, three year doctorate of medical Qigong with Jerry Allen Johnson. It was super inspirational for me to sort of dive into the emotional uh, and spiritual aspect of, of, life but then also pain and so then we use stellate ganglion block we use ketamine we use just talking and kind of being in a connected space to try to help reset that 
And if if you can do if you can do it, I think it's profoundly healing. And I think it's the most important healing really that you can do. And so then we're looking at all times for any tool or any technique that can help people feel safe and connected and grounded so that so that uh, you know Jerry Allen Johnson he he always used to say all of my patients uh, are healed and some of them are even healed physically <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah yeah so, well said you know I was um, fortunate enough to spend a couple days with Rhonda Byrne and you know she's the 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 one that wrote the book, The Secret. This was just literally a couple days ago. And I was sitting with her for breakfast and she made a comment that I found so profound. She says, there's only two emotions. There's love and there's fear. That's it. Nothing else. And so what happens is when we move away from who our true nature is, which is pure love, and we we have the illusion, you know, that there's, you know, um, things that bring up fear for us and uh, you know this brings up a disease you know it's a lack of ease in the body right um so you know i think that that when, when you look at it like that it's not a surprise that a lot of emotions get stored in our tissues you know because there's there's times when i've done um, endonasal balloons or different types of body work on people and they'll just start crying profusely because that that memory was stored in their tissues and I almost think about it like, um, like a like a thumb drive. You know, it's like for fiber optics. I mean, there's information there, and when you release that information, then it comes up for people. That actually can be quite healing for a lot of people. Yeah, I've had that experience on multiple occasions where there'll be this cascade of memories and traumas uh, being, you know, coming to my awareness, coming into my consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I I had no intention of bringing that about. I wasn't like, I'm getting some deep body work. I'm going to think about some trauma. It's just, you know, like, oh, that feels good. Yeah. Rub right there. And, you know, they start hitting a spot and all of a sudden, yeah, there's this sort of almost transcendent experience that takes place in terms of, um, I had a little bit, uh, actually one of those yesterday, Mm -hmm. you know, I was there. uh, an emotional release and tears in my eyes. And then I was kind of brought back to, one of the, if not the root causes of that issue that I was having. And it was, had nothing to do with the physical body. It was just, you know, kind of, um, an emotional trauma, you know? And I think that's, I think that's something that a lot of us, um, perhaps miss, especially those that become so focused on the physical body, right. That we kind of lose touch of, um, our consciousness itself and that it actually has the ability to, to guide us into healing some of these things that are downstream, you know, mm-hmm. and connecting to that. I know both of you guys are, you know, very much um, into that. And I'm glad we got to touch on it because in my journey, that's how I've arrived at kind of the self-love that's facilitated so much of the healing or just the inspiration to track someone down like each of you and do some work with you. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of like that underlying sense of um, being worthy of healing and actually feel like you're deserving of being whole and complete, Mm. which can't come from reading a book or an intellectual process. It's got to be really that felt. You mean there's not a pill for that? (laughs) I can't just take a pill. There there are (laughs) some. There's a peptide for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, we might be talking about some psychedelic medications as well. Yeah, exactly. And and those have been a big part of of my Mm. journey and coming to that. So, you know, I definitely wanted to, to touch on that and close on that as we're talking about the physicality of our experience that you know let's not forget about consciousness and the emotional Mm. healing as it gets trapped in and then manifest in these physical uh, symptoms Mm. Uh, i want to ask you guys one last question i think i've asked you this in our prior interview so i'll start with uh with matt uh who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life and your work that you might share with us uh okay so arcadi is this my yoga teacher who's just totally a larger than life, amazing, generous, amazing human being. And, uh, and it, I walk around my clinic and I always like, I, and, and me and Barb studied with Arcadi for 10 years. And we basically spent 24 hours a day trying to deconstruct everything that Arcadi said to us <laughs> um and he's not like the kinder gentler yoga teacher like he's definitely like a the russian <laughs> uh yoga teacher but he's just the, totally the greatest and i still walk around all day and like am 
still kind of deconstructing him in my mind and even in my practice. Um, Jerry Allen Johnson was just the most incredible, you know, Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Qigong, Bagua teacher for me. Um, and and then my parents, my, my parents are just totally the greatest. I love them. Mm. They want, you know, it was interesting. <laughs> like I, 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 I tell everybody like there was this joke and my family that psychology didn't work. My uncle Dan would always, you know, talk about the crazies who my dad took care of because my dad's a psychologist. And so then the idea was, is that I was going to do the farthest thing from, from uh, psychology and be an anesthesiologist. And yet I think, you know, both of my parents are my greatest teachers. And the, the reality is, is that I'm a psychologist with a needle <laughs> mm. yeah. and an ultrasound. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> That's funny. Very true. How about you, John? Well, you can reference the last one as far yeah. as the last. But, <laughs> yeah. but I will. I'd like to add Rhonda Byrne. I don't think I mentioned her okay. on the last one, and she she just blew my mind uh, when I was with her last last time. And one of the the two things, and you may may or not be may or may not be ready to hear this, but for me, I was sitting there talking about this idea. And this is kind of deep consciousness. Is I had this idea that there was like this master consciousness, which was God, right? And then I was this consciousness here, and I'm kind of talking to her about my idea. And she looks over and she says, John, there's only one consciousness. And she says, and it's you. So with that said, <laughs> meditate on that. <laughs> uh, awesome. Thank you, guys. And uh, give us the stats on where we can find your, your practices and things like that, which, of course, we'll put in the show notes. Yeah, so um, I have a supplement company. We make both suppositories and liposomals, which in the high dose melatonin and the NAD, we also have an oral version. And nasal sprays. A and, lot of the listeners by now will have and, seen me or, or with the Zen. themselves with oh, the, yeah. the yeah. Zen spray. Incredible, <laughs> incredible. Which stuff. I'm going to do a Zen as soon as we're done. because uh, I did yeah. one right before. Oh, did you? Yeah. Um, yeah, so mitozen, M-I-T-O-Z-E-N.com. And then our clinic is advancedrejuvenation.us. Cool. Awesome. And that's in Sarasota, Florida. In Sarasota, yeah. Florida. And you get a lot of people, I'm sure both of you traveling in, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah. because they can't find what Quite they need bit. in their town or city. Yeah. And then we are at bioreset.com. And so then we've got a practice here in Silicon Valley and another one coming in uh, South Florida. Mm -hmm. And right down the road from me, right? Right down the road. We're, <laughs> we're going to be hanging Why out. Why don't all you the just time. join my practice? We'll just make one collective. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be a collective for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so then we'll we'll give you the website for the um, the peptide academy as well. Oh, cool, great, yeah, and and thank you for for doing that work too. I just God, I'd love to see these become more widely available and hopefully um, not regulated into oblivion. Mm -hmm. Such a useful and safe uh, method of uh, mm -hmm. medicine. You know, it's just I love it. I've I've been used. I ran out as I was telling you, but peptides have been huge for me. I did want to say one thing about the the DSIP, uh, the sl deep sleep one. I was cautious with that. I didn't use it all the time, but I, I would track my sleep and uh, I would get great deep sleep scores, but it tanked my REM sleep. Mm. That's what I so, noticed about that. Yeah, I'm not a super DSIP person. I think it's a useful little adjunct intermittently, but I, I agree. And and so then the it's like the you, you you talk about like the problems of our day and I think sleep is like one of the defining things that a lot of people have a lot of trouble with giving people as people in their 60s and 70s a lot of times you give them some cannabis plus or minus like our little trifecta we talked about can be profoundly helpful for them mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. awesome yeah. all right let's yeah. give the elders some weed no <laughs> yeah. thanks for joining me today guys incredible conversation and thank you so much uh matt and also you john for being there with your input too man yeah, you guys awesome, are john. Thanks. pleasure you yeah, guys are just you magicians and wizards of the highest order and i really appreciate the work you're doing in the world and and for coming on the show thank you Larry.